Wayne. Good to see you. There he is. Can you can you see this I this photograph? See, uh, I don't see the photograph yet. I see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I I I can't say that I'm really great at uh, um, using. Share your screen. There. Do you see it now? Oh, oh that's great. I think Ted this is, I think this is you here. I think that might be right. This is Scotty Franz, I know that. And Tad McGuire, but I can't figure out who this person is here. But I think this one's you. <laughs> and do, do you know when that was taken? What year? That was early on, like Tumar Blue, right? I would let's see. This is on um Crawford, so I'm guessing maybe Aquila. Okay. But it's yeah, it is. Uh, it's definitely the early years. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do a screen capture of that. I I'll I'll send it to you. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fun. <laughs> That's really terrific. Thanks so much. Yeah. So, well, it's great to see you. Where are you? Are you in New Hampshire now, or? No, I was there. I left uh, Monday. So actually, so I was there uh, on vacation for about 10 days up on Newfound Lake. My uh, cousin, Greg Goss, has a place there that I stay, that I rent, I stay with. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess I did. Uh, I mean, Greg mentioned that you guys were cousins. Did you see Rob while you were here? I did see Rob. Mar Rob and I hiked several trails on Cardigan. Oh, nice. Yeah, hiked, uh, yeah, it was really fun. We hiked up the west side, which I had, had done from Canaan. Yeah, yeah. And then around the top. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I won't say that's my easy hike up Cardigan, but it does cut out half of the distance. It's, it's yeah, I'd never done it before. Pretty uh, steep. Yeah, and then we did pieces. I'd never done the, or at least I don't remember doing the Vista Mount and the Skyland Trails. Oh, I'm not even, yeah, I don't even remember them at all. Yeah, they're, they're towards the south, the Vista Mount and Skyland. Um, it comes off the Clark Trail, which is kind of on the s south side. Yeah, I, I spent quite a bit of time. Did four different hikes on my vacation on cardigan which and where are you living now i work for the i live in vicksburg mississippi i work for the army corps of engineers i'm a hydrogeologist hydrologist doing water supply projects for the army corps i've been in consulting in the past um i actually listened to david uh, David Cummings, pod, the podcast you do with David Cummings before yeah. doing this to kind of get in. <laughs> I wanted to hear one of these. And so, uh, of course, <laughs> David did a great, articulate job of discussing his Mowgli experience. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, so what year did you come to Mowgli? Steve? I came to Mowgli. I'm sorry. Let me just start by formally introducing you. Um, this is my old friend, Steve Turnbull, who, uh, uh, he's, he's younger than, he's younger than me. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I was sort of a, I think I was a junior counselor, um, when you were, when you were a camper, but, uh, anyway, um, Steve, tell us how you came to Mowgli. So I started to my 1970 with David Cummings and um, Tony Smith was there as well as Scotty France, um, Ian Jacoby. And so I was there five years as a camper, graduated in 19, 1974. I took a year off and I came back as a junior staff in 1976. And then I went on to do other things. So I was a camper for five years in the pack and then one year as a junior staff, 1976. Uh -huh. 
and we're, we will get into your professional life uh, later on in the podcast, but uh, it's sort of, uh, there's this continuing thread about Tumai being the place where uh, hydrogeologists and engineers got their start. Oh, is that right? With, with the little, with the Tumai Dam projects. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, my dad went to Mowgli, I think 1947 and 1948. Um, he got a scholarship there back, way back when, you know, in the 40s, where for several years. So my dad went to Mowgli, and then Greg, and then I had other cousins, um, James Gleason also, right. uh, or my cousin. So there was quite a few of our family that, because my dad had found out about it because he grew up in Alexandria. So. Oh, okay. So he had New Hampshire roots. Oh yeah, absolutely. He went to Durban college. So he, he was well, you know, he went to Mowgli, so he knew all about it and what, you know, definitely uh, wanted me to go. And, and I remember liking it the whole entire time thinking it was it was all it was always a great experience and it's it's instilled a total love of Newfound Lake because all my experience on Newfound Lake and in New Hampshire are always almost always on vacation. You know, it's always been right. a, it, I've never lived there other than to go visit. So it has extremely the whole all the mountains in New Hampshire and the lakes all have mostly almost entirely fond memories. Yeah. Because I never worked there and never went to school there <laughs> um other than vermont i worked in vermont some which is similar in burlington um so uh, you know i was uh i was uh playing with my dog there uh where where the uh, newfound marina used to be and it's now right gray, they call that gray oaks or gray rocks i think gray rocks yep. yeah and uh the uh it, it was the first time i've seen the the nesting bald eagles that are there uh, oh, nice. on the lake uh, right above me we were i was throwing the ball to him in the in the water and uh i guess he must have attracted the attention of the of one of the eagles and they came by to check it out that's wonderful yeah it's i mean that's something that's happened since we were at Mowgli is that uh, the Eagles have come back in New Hampshire. That's terrific. And the loons have returned to Newfound Lake. I oh, never, yeah. I never remember loons when I was a camper there. Right. And, and they're there right. now. Yeah, we've made, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly reasons to be cynical about uh, things these days, but we've made some pretty good progress on uh, restoring some of the endangered species from the area. And I think the lake water quality is better now than yeah. it was in the campers. Because huh. I remember having restrictions on going into the water if there was a storm and the lake level rose and flooded people's septic tanks. I can remember not being able huh. to swim, you know, for a week. That yeah. Then we would not to go in the water i think it was well yeah and back in those days of course uh, you know the the pema Jawasset wasn't exactly a clean river yeah uh, it, in fact i don't think we ever took uh canoe trips on the pema Jawasset because it was well they they were it was starting to come back it was in the late 60s i think that we had the battles over cleaning up the pemi but uh um the baker was pretty clean. We used to go there pretty regularly. Yeah. Yep. So, well, the, yeah, the Pemigewasa hadn't recovered from all the. I remember my mom, who grew up in Bristol, telling me the Pemigewasa River stunk horribly in the 30s and 40s. Oh yeah. When she was a little kid, right from all the paper mills in Lincoln and yeah, you know, and all those fortunately are gone. Yeah. Well, my mom and dad were involved in the cleanup efforts on the Pemigewasset River. And we had bricks thrown through our win the window of our home and threats, oh, to burn, no. threats to burn it down. And 
um, you know, I uh, learned my environmental ethic from my mom and dad. Wow. Did not realize that. And my mom was the nurse at Mowgli for for yeah. four years. So <laughs> I think uh, Craig Bankson's and Bob Bankson's mom had taken over by the time yep. I was a yep. camper. I recall she was there, oh, I think, all of the years I was there. So you, you've named some of the kids that were in your dorm. Are there others who stood out over the years that... Well, certainly in my class, you know, we, we had some real overachievers. David Cummings, of course, who's a research doctor. Uh, Forty Conklin, who's you know, works at Merrill Lynch. And Scotty France, who's... And then certainly Craig Bankston, that, you know, in, in, in broadcasting, we had right. some real... And, and then kids we've we've kind of lost track of. We are going to try uh, to see how many be this this year, this summer will be the 50th anniversary, not the one that's the next summer will be the 50th anniversary of our, of our den. We're going to try to do on crew, crew weekend a, a gathering to see how many of the 14 campers i think we have most everybody's email and so rob may get with you about a few of the outliers to see if we can at least invite everyone yeah all 14 and and see how many can show up oh that would be so cool yeah uh, i know cool. it would be great uh because i know Mowgli has a had a huge effect on me as a, as a boy and man growing up and i talked to greg about this my cousin is it, it, you know, it really makes a huge difference, I think, um, in, in your life. And, and I think one of the main things you learn is you're, at, you're just to never give up, you know, and to really be assertive and to get out there and do the best you can and, 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 and never give up, you know, and, and because you learn to overcome so many things at Mowgli. Yeah. Well, I remember that about you, that you were a really persistent kid. I mean, you were, it, it seems to me you were, I, I don't know that you were retiring or shy, but you, I mean, you pushed yourself and it was well, really I, clear. Yeah, I, well, I think I was, you were competing against people, not competing, competing is the wrong word, but trying to be more like your den mates or your camp mates, like, David Cummings and Rob and Scotty and, and Forty yep. and you know, trying to be more, trying to be more like them in terms of being you know a good, uh, good at the camp experience and trying to make your summer be all that it could be. Yeah. What do you uh, remember of trips in those early years? Well, I can remember. I remember taking the war canoe down to Belle Isle. Um, I remember doing that. I remember that. I remember camping at Mount Cardigan. Um, I, uh, in terms of mountains, you know, I remember going to Camp uh, Mount Musawaki. We hiked, we hiked, hiked that into my uh, course. I remember doing in Panther. We went up Mount Washington. Um, I remember going, and so I, and and that really. Uh, and still a love of hiking to this day. In a lot of ways, of all the mountains in New Hampshire, Cardigan is my favorite, almost my favorite. Yeah. Because it's, it's so much fun to hike, and it's so accessible. Um, right. yeah. And it's such, such a great view, right? I mean, you just, it's, I can actually remember you saying once that you had almost as much fun on the local mountains, like Mount, Mount you know, Cardigan, Mowgli, uh, bear, sugarloaf, little sugarloaf, big sugarloaf, as the mount is dry, you know, driving a long distance and going up into the into the White Mountains, you know, up onto the presidential range. Right. Yep. It's true. I mean, there, I, I have a real fondness for the Mahusiks, but, uh, you know, the, the presidentials are a great hike, but. Uh, oh, they are. They're wonderful. They're great. Yeah. It's terrific. Um, but you go to the presidentials now and it's crowd, very crowded. Yeah. You know, and you have to get off the beaten path. The cardigan is, of course, cardigan can get crowded too. Yeah. Last, last time I was up there, they're renovating the fire tower on cardigan. I don't know if you knew that. I just heard about that. Yeah. 
They'll have it done in three weeks, they say. Uh huh. They're going to, the car, basically, they're renovating the metal frame. And then they're going, they're making of either some kind of a prefab or fiberglass um, building to bring in there that they're going to raise, it's one piece that they're going to raise by helicopter and plop on the stand huh. to renovate it. I thought that's a great idea. Because the guy we were talking to, I was up there a week ago, and he said, oh, as soon as we started taking apart the the, the main building on the top of the tower, it just disintegrated. All, all that old wood, you know, just huh. fell apart. Sure. Wow. I, I have some photographs that I've been uh, trying to make some repairs to from uh, from the Smith family when they were at the when when uh, Mickey Smith, whom you will remember as the guy who came, who was the National Geographic photographer who would come. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Well, he was trip master at Mowgli years before me. And um, <clears throat> anyway, he, he I don't know if you, you knew this, but he grew up living in the summertime, not the, uh, in the spring, summer, and fall, he grew up living on the top of Cardigan. And really? Every, every day he would have to hike down to go to school. Really? And then hike back up. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. And there's this great yeah. story. His dad, his dad's name was, uh, Mickey's real name was Clyde, as, but he was Clyde Smith Jr., and Clyde no and and Clyde Senior was the fellow who carved most of the old trail signs, um, oh. but but in the summertime he was the uh, warden on in the tower, and and he used to tell this story uh, about one day walking out onto the you know I don't know what they're doing with the new tower, but the old tower had sort of a walkway around the yeah. around the outside, um, like a deck. And he, he used to tell this story about walking out onto the deck and looking down at this uh, this area that was a big patch of blueberries and seeing his little son, Mickey, picking blueberries and eating blueberries. And directly on the other side of that big patch of blueberries was a black bear. <laughs> and he said he watched. He didn't dare yell or anything because he was afraid he might scare the bear or mickey so he just watched as the two of them both went you know counterclockwise around that patch of blueberries ate their fill and walked away and never knew <laughs> that the other had been there it's a great story <laughs> yeah. so did he walk down to alexandria or canaan for school he'd wondering? walk down to alexandria okay Catch the catch the school bus into I guess Bristol. I'm not sure. You know. Yeah, certain... I think Alexandria stopped having village schools in this a long time ago, and yeah. I think kids all took the bus to Bristol yeah. or somewhere else. Yeah. Hebron only only uh, got rid of their. Uh, one it's that was actually a two grade schoolhouse gosh I, I less than 10 years ago really i knew the last teacher who was no kidding who was there and her her husband was uh uh the director at mayhew oh that's terrific well i remember playing baseball with the kids at mayhew several times they came up to maui and we played baseball against them and then we went down to Mayhew at least twice. Yeah. And and played baseball. You know, of course all 14 of us knew how to play baseball, right? We all played baseball. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. But the Mayhew kids, I mean, they were serious about baseball. I think you we usually I, I sort of recall we usually lost to them because they played <laughs> a lot of baseball yeah. in the summer and we all we played baseball with each other, not very much. So we, you know, we weren't very good as a team because we didn't play baseball a lot. We played some. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, but we but you you played on Gray Brothers Field where you there was no sliding involved. In... I remember playing them in the upper ball. The upper, oh, you did. Okay. The upper, what used to be now is a parking lot. Used to be the upper ball field. Of course, they've moved that down. Right. Where the old archery range. Yeah. The archery range. Yeah, I think it, a lot of folks don't realize that, you know, in 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 those days, in the seventies, and I think even into the eighties, the uh, uh, what's the ball field now down in, you know, near the Den Bridge was nothing but a little swampy area. Yeah, it was. Bob Bankston cleared that out mostly, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, I think there were a lot of folks that did a lot of work. Right. Yeah cleaning cleaning all that out that was that was a great addition to do that right that's where bob got the reputation of uh having the tractor as his chariot <laughs> uh, so okay so uh, uh you went to belle isle and uh as you progressed into the uh into the older dorms uh talk about the the change in the sort of trips that you took and what what that was like boy you know uh of course they start you to do bigger and bigger trips as you go mm -hmm. which is great and i always i always remember liking you know i i should remember better the names of all the mountains we climbed the flume slide trail we're doing that washington eisenhower um I'm sure there's been others, but no. Now that them. that photograph that I showed you, I'll I'll make sure to put that in the that show great, notes yeah. and on the, uh, you know, on the uh, Facebook site. But uh, uh, that was taken on Mount Crawford, which is part of the Montalban Ridge, headed toward up toward Washington. Yeah, that's great. Now, did you do? I can't remember if we did. I, we did the Montalbans in those days, but I'm not sure that I had started taking trips up there then or not. I sort of recall my last. Do you, were you tripmaster in 1974 time frame, or is that? I like think it? I was tripmaster in '74. I yeah. think you were too. Yeah. I think you were too, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. I think I Andy Poppinchock was was '73. And, uh, okay. you know, I, you, you'll get a kick out of this because uh, the, the last guy or I interviewed, uh, I guess, about a week ago, Greg Copeland's. You, do, hang on. Let me shut. Yeah, mouth. sure. Tony. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Do you remember Greg Copeland's? He was from England. I think I do sort of remember him. Yeah. instructor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I do kind of remember now. Yeah. And I think I think he was an instructor when I was there. He, yeah. He well, he was there in seventy two and seventy three. Yeah, and, and that's he, when I got my yell. Was it Golden Anchor? Yeah, yeah Golden Anchor. Yeah. Yeah. So that would have been yeah seventy three. I think is when I got my Golden Anchor. So that'd be about right. You got your Golden Anchor in seventy three. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I sort of recall, yeah. He was talking about the the cultural differences between sailing in in England and sailing here, and he said that uh, instead of using the when they were coming about, instead of using the term hard lee, they would in England they used lee ho, and apparently. Hmm. Kids would walk by Matt Mowgli and say, Leo, Mr. Copeland's Leo. <laughs> I remember that. They would laugh about that. that that's, that's. I do remember lots of great sailing trips, though. And I can remember running with the wind down to Wellington State Park. And then when the north wind, we got a good stiff north wind in the afternoon and then tacking all the way back to Mowgli. And it was great fun. Just really wow. nice wind. Of course, you the lake in Newfound. The generally the winds pick up in the after. If they're going to pick up, they pick up in the afternoon. Usually the wind the winds are bigger in the afternoon than they yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. So you remember actually going down to to Wellington in a sailboat, huh? Yeah, I remember going to Wellington, and so we had Flying Juniors then. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah. White and yellow ones, if I recall. White ones and yellow ones. Yeah. And they had the yeah. jib and a main. So they were a lot of fun. They were a good, they were a good teaching boat for kids. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still do you sail now? No, I don't sail now. No. I don't either. No, I don't. I'd like to again, but no, I sure. don't. Sure. Yeah. So uh Akila, yeah. did you do the Nancy Brook trip? I'm pretty sure. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think about that, uh, uh, the gorge there at Nancy Brook. Yeah. That wonderful. Do you there. have, is there, a, is there a write up of all the trips that Michael used to do? I wonder. Well, I, we always, I always asked uh, counselors to, to submit a log to me. So somewhere there are old Mowgli logs in books that, uh, that where they would describe the trip and if there was a particular incident or if there was a problem with a, with a meal or whatever it was it would get recorded but i haven't yeah. i haven't seen them I'm, they i'm sure they're in the the archives the, the, there's it's just been the last few years that the that the archives uh have really that they've started really working on archiving a lot of information and they actually have now a, a climate controlled storage places or oh, place nice. for the archives which is yeah it's really cool and a lot of great old photographs and and richard morgan has has uh, taken on the task of of uh, trying to get all the uh, old films digitized oh that's a great idea yeah 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 so, i remember richard morgan uh, he was a leader of the brass group that played on at uh, chapel on sunday which i yeah. was in as a trombone player i think he was a trombone player also yes he was yeah i saw him i was on a work day a couple of years ago and ran into richard it was great to see him he lives in new hampshire or what over near meredith or somewhere over there well, uh, last I knew, well, I mean, he grew up in Sandwich. Sandwich, right? That's right. Yeah. I think he, I think he got his mom's old house in Sandwich. I think he's back in Sandwich again. Uh -huh. At least in the summer. He right. said in the winter it's hard to live there because he's, <laughs> he's. They say he said the electric lines in his street are still from the electrification of that part of the county in 1927. <laughs> <laughs> no, he said the. The power is pretty reliable in the wintertime. Yeah. Well, I heard that a couple of years back, he bought an old school bus and that in the winter, he was kind of taking it out and touring touring around and it probably uh, staying at some of those places out west where you can, where you can park and like, camp for free. Yeah, sure. On BLM land. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, um, what ribbons did you get? Um, certainly got my golden anchor. I remember my silver ribbon. Uh, but you know, it's a good question. I had enough to get an inner circle, but I don't remember which ribbons I got. Mm -hmm. Certainly not as many as Scotty France did or David Cummings or some of the other folks in our, in our class that got um, more ribbons. I remember meeting all my graduation requirements. I don't know if you recall, there were graduation requirements. Well, still, they still have them. Yep. I think that that's one of the greatest things about Mowgli is that you really have to, you know, you, there's those goals that you set for yourself and you, and there's certain things that uh, you may not really want to do, uh, but, you, but uh, they're required. And I think that one of the beauties of Mowgli is that for the outdoors, you learn a little bit of everything. You use that, you learn actmanship, you learn canoeing, you need to learn sailing, you need to rowing, you learn swimming, camping, tennis, archery. If you, and so you end up lose, using those experiences throughout your life. Oh, I need to chop a tree down or I got it, you know, oh, I remember I did this at Mowgli, right? I need to canoe. So I went on a canoe trip. 
uh, in Upper State New York. And oh, I, you know, I did this. I remember to do it. I can still go use a sailboat. Um, and I think that's a very valuable experience. Yeah, having all those experiences. Right. Did did you? Did you really, while you were a kid, did you notice that the the sort of the effect that it had on your self confidence? Oh yeah, I think absolutely. It was. Uh, I think that's one of the beauties of Mildly, is that uh, it it has an immense ability to get, help you get self confident, and even if you're not the most highest achieving person in your dorm, you still have a great time. And you learn enough to have it be helpful in your life. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you know, you end up not being the very best tennis player ever, you know. But you learn tennis well enough to play it. Mm -hmm. So you learn so many things well enough to, to be able to do them in your life. And I and I think being in your group, uh, you try to, you want to try to be better because there's all these. And I remember, you know, you were, you were Wayne is, were one of the, you know, higher achievers at the camp. You know, you were one of the guys we looked up to. You were the trip master. I remember thinking, oh, Wayne, no, we don't want, we don't want to get Wayne mad at us, right? We want, we want, we want Wayne to think we're good, you know, we're, we're good mildly men. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I still you say. there for a long time. Yeah. I still say that uh, that that learning how to build a fire in the rain was probably one of the most uh, um, inspiring things that I ever did in terms of uh, my own self confidence. Yeah, sure. I remember building a fire in the rain. Sure. Yeah. yeah it wasn't easy. No, it wasn't easy. You had to no, be a lot of the hikes weren't very easy i mean you know it was, right it was a lot of the hikes were a lot of work and you um but it it was a great it was overall a great experience and you know and i that's i have you know very um, so i'm very much looking forward to hopefully we'll be able to get as many of our denites together for the 50 year anniversary of our graduating from den well, if you need to if you need to get somebody pumped up and they haven't done a podcast yet, you let me know and I'll I'll start working on them. Okay. <laughs> I I've been trying to get Phil Hart to do one. He's, well, that'd be great. Oh, Phil Hart. Okay. Oh, he hasn't done one. No, he hasn't done one. He's he's been avoiding me. And then the funny thing is, he agrees to do it when I talk when I actually get through to him by phone. He agrees to do it and then we arrange a time and he doesn't answer his phone <laughs> uh now how old is phil now i uh, i guess he's probably mid to late 70s yeah sure yeah so well I, i'll eventually get him but uh, i i think i'm gonna have to surprise him i may i may borrow a friend's phone to call to make the call so that he doesn't recognize the <laughs> assistant director when I was there, if I can recall. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh so uh you did the Mahusics in Panther? I believe that's correct. Sure. I think yeah. I remember that. Do you remember going through the notch, Mahusic notch? Not specifically. Okay. Well, you know what? when you make another trip in new hampshire you ought to think about going back there because that is magical um i did it a, the, the the i don't know if you remember that i ran for governor in 19 i think i heard about that yeah yep i got uh i got my clock cleaned and then i yeah got out of politics but I, one of the things that i did to get my head straight afterwards was uh i took my dog and i did a solo trip in the mahusics and uh, that's a good that's good therapy yeah it was <laughs> yeah it was really fun and you know i don't know what it's like now because i haven't been back there in 
20 years. But um, the, the, the beautiful thing about the Mahusiks was that even though it was on the Appalachian Trail, it was out of the way enough that they didn't have the kind of restrictions on camping that oh, okay. most of the rest of the state had. So you could like set up your tent at the top of a mountain. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. I, I'm sure that's not the case anymore, but one of the and things. I remember, of course, being in, we won my crew, my den year, we won, we run, we won as blue racing crew. I remember that. So that was, that was a great experience. I oh, remember. you did? Yeah, we did win. Okay. Now what year was then? 74. 74. Okay. 73, we, uh, Red Racing Crew won with, against, you know, that we had, I don't know if you remember, but 73 had Jim Lynch and the Gehring Brothers and Blue Racing Crew. And uh, we all thought, you know, oh, this is, these huge, it was going to be a cakewalk. Right. And, uh, and Rob Werner and Scotty France, they had this great, team of six and they were and i remember that red racing crew one with a much gr smaller group of guys well right. it only goes to show that i think i early on i learned overconfidence from that from seeing that overconfidence can definitely do you in because you yeah. think you're going to win to the point that you don't really try very hard and then something goes wrong and you you, you don't end up winning yeah yeah i mean those I, I was the crew leader in 73 and the red crew leader. And uh, those kids were fired up. Yeah. <laughs> that was. I uh, remember you were in red crew. Yeah. Cause I was in blue crew. Cause my dad was in blue crew. Yep. Yep. Greg's all my family, Greg and Jim, sure. Bruce, James, Bruce and I were also in blue because of my dad being in blue. So we, you know, you kind of, it's kind of a madly tradition to pick, be in the same crew that your that your parent or that your relatives were in. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, well, you 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 came from a good bloodline. Oh, thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> uh, the Gleason boys and and uh, Greg Goss were just really fine people. Well, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, because my my actually my grandmother taught at the Alexandria school when she first moved to New Hampshire in 1947 or 46 or something like that, right after World War II. And why did she move to New Hampshire? Do you know? My, uh, my grandpa and uh, my cousin had a paint metal object painting business that they still have actually in Newton. Painting mesal objects, elevators, uh, and he developed a process to which, they, of course, they use constantly now. Basically, you, you charge the paint, and you charge the ob no, the char object gets charges negatively, and the paint gets charged positively, and that helps the paint adhere to the oh, which yeah. they started doing in the late forties. Huh. And my grandpa was going to be his. He start start the business in new hampshire oh so that's what they came up to do and then oh, he went on to run he when i to be president of the bristol bank which is now i think uh get the d i forget the name of the it's got you know the bristol bank is no longer yeah yeah so uh, talk about <laughs> Talk about your den year, your stat, what, squads. Well, it, go ahead. Do my den year? Yeah, my that was that was a terrific. Of course, the neat thing about it's your last year as a camper, and I think you all of a sudden as as campers, the difference between panther and den is is you all of a sudden decide you're adults almost. Yeah, I remember there were there was fewer. Fewer pranks and shenanigans, what I call shenanigans, you know, <laughs> before we went to Den. We were starting to be more responsible. Did you ever end up on Mr. Hart's porch? No, I never did. I never remember being reprimanded by Mr. Hart Sr. 
you know, WB hard. Was that was that because you were a really good boy, or because I think so? I think I just you know I just kind of stayed out of trouble. I, you know, I don't remember. I never remember being reprimanded. Of course, by Phil, everybody got reprimanded by Mister Phil. <laughs> I don't think it was possible to be in a camper and not have done something that you needed, he needed to chat with you about. I don't remember, but I don't remember any specifics. Well, you know, the only time I almost got fired was because I had an argument with Phil Hart in front of the other, in front of kids. And Mr., you know, Mr. Hart probably would have been much more forgiving if we had had that argument in private but because we yeah, did not... and it was my fault i mean i i was a headstrong young guy and uh um mr hart you know he was in the the fbi i don't know if you knew that but i think i did rob told me that and i did not know that that he was in the fbi as part during the manhattan project yeah, yeah. Which in the Mowgli in, in the document for the national for the the camp being registered is a play, historic places lists that I guess. Yep. Was... Well, he he uh, walked over to the wall and he pulled the thumbtack out of this piece of paper and he brought it over to me and he said, "I want you to look at this," and it was the FBI loyalty oath. <laughs> <laughs> really and i thought oh i'm dead <laughs> but it gave me another chance <laughs> yeah, i think i true. was a i think i was a junior counselor the funny thing is it was the same the same summer that happened right at the beginning of the summer and the same summer i got promoted to senior staff by mr hart at the toward the end of the summer so that's terrific yeah yeah, yeah. he was yeah. quite a guy wasn't he yeah well i i thought the camp was very you know my recollection of it was ext was extremely well run very well managed yeah the camper and the staff i do remember that so you were on what squad uh i think washington squad but uh the I, and that's a bit of an interesting thing. Um, they messed up the reservations. And um, so I didn't, wasn't able to, they, the reservations got messed up and they had to go the last week of camp instead of middle of camp like they usually do. Oh. And um, so uh, I was unable to go, but I was nominated. Oh, I, okay. I ended up. So uh, I later on hiked up and rented cab, you know, did some of those lod, those huts just to do them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you, did you have to leave camp early? Yeah, I had to leave camp a little bit early. So I was going to miss a few days of. Bummer. Uh, yeah, that, that is a bummer. Yeah, that was, that was, a you know, looking back on it, I should have yeah. gone. So. So do you, what do you remember of being on the junior staff? Oh, I remember that was a great experience, David. And that's when David and Rob and I sort of planned our uh, hike that we did a year later to go out, oh. to, go out to Teton and um, in Yellowstone National Parks, which was my first big trip sort of all by myself, which was very successful. We didn't have any trouble with get you know, it was... It was quite the adventure. Um, it's oddly enough, David has the year. He said we went in 1978. Uh, we actually went in 1977 because I remember we were a week in the backcountry in the Tetons and we came out and we asked people, hey, we've been gone in the woods. Of course, there were no, there were no cell phones in those days and you didn't hear anything. When you went into the backcountry in the Tetons, you didn't get any news for a whole week. And we came out and we asked, what's happened? And, oh, Elvis Presley had died. <laughs> yeah. That's what had happened during, the, oh, <laughs> Elvis died. Elvis Presley died. So it was, it, and I just looked, just to be right, I looked that up and he did die in 1977. So that was the year we did that. Wow. 
and and so you were in the back country of the Tetons and uh, and and there were no cell phones and the only protection from bears was uh uh a bell on your on your boot probably. yeah you wore you wore bear bells we never ever saw a bear and then you tied your food up in the in the trees at night were you par were you paranoid about it though no we never i and all the times i've hiked out west i did a trip in glacier teton never even saw one yeah or even saw a grizzly bear well i have to I tell you a funny story about about hiking in glacier because i was terrified they made us they they, they made us uh, they required you to do a half a day sort of a bear sociology training oh that's new when we in 76 when i did that trip we didn't have to do that uh -huh. well i think i've heard the bears have gotten more aggressive you know there's just more of them there you know and they're a little you, you yeah. run into them more frequently well, I went with my friend Christopher, and he and I, uh, uh, you know, we did everything we were supposed to do. We we cooked and uh, we took our clothes off after we were after we cooked, and we hung them in the tree with the food. Wow! And yeah. Put on uh, fresh clothes that didn't smell attractive to bears. But the funniest part of it was that when we got to our tent, the two of us would stand on opposite sides of the tent facing out in outside of the tent facing out and we would pee around the, the entire tent so we would pee and step step to the side step to the side thinking that it was going to to deter a bear deter them. did you did you hear them at night um we saw scat but never heard or saw yeah that was my experience too back in you know we saw their scat and um signs of logs that looked like they'd torn them apart but no yeah. actual bears yeah well it's nice i i mean it's nice how they've made a comeback in so many of these places and you know the the public now go, uh, goes and votes in Fat Bear Week, and right, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So yeah, that's really cool that you guys took that trip. Were you planning that from the time that you were at Mowgli? Yeah. We talked about it as junior staff at Mowgli, and then we planned it for a year and did it the following year. That's awesome. So yeah. tell tell us about the arc of your life since then. Okay, so yeah, sure. So I went to did my undergrad in geology at Virginia Tech after Mowgli, and then got my master's in New Mexico School of Mines. And so I've worked in hydrogeology, water resources. Actually, since then, I worked for a different bunch of different several different consulting firms. Lived for. Um, 10 years in Hawaii, I was out in Oahu doing uh, water resources, working for, doing mostly uh, environmental compliance for military bases and different uh -huh. hydrology projects. Uh, you um, know, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I got my sure. geology as well, but I think a lot of people don't recognize that, you know, that the New Mexico School of Mines is like the Harvard for geologists. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a great school. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I've got my master's in hydrology there. That was a great, 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 great education. Uh, I mean, either there or University of Arizona, in terms of back in the day in the 70s and 80s when I went, the New Mexico School of Mines and University of Arizona were two of the top uh, hydrology programs. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, recently, my uh, I did long-term training. I went to UCLA, worked on my PhD for a year. Um, that didn't work out. I didn't ever get my PhD, but uh, was but certainly was able to spend a year at UCLA working on my PhD in hydrology. That was a great experience. Um, and now I work. I work on probably worked in Kwajalein Island. I went to do the. I was in. Kwajalein Island for two weeks this summer measuring water levels and 
going to do a evaluation of groundwater there. I'm also sorry, do... where where is that? Kwajalein is a military is in the Marshall Islands. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, Kwajalein Island. There's it's an art. The places I went were army bases and measured water levels and salinity in 69 of the wells on Kwajalein Island and 32 of the wells on Roy Nimur, another island. So I still do field work and then modeling and do different groundwater models and some service water models. I'm doing a lot with forecast informed reservoir operations. So we're trying, basically the nut of that is that's about a third of my work maybe. And that's to figure out how do we, how do we as the Corps of Engineers store more water in existing lakes? Uh, because most of the operation manuals for those lakes when they were written when they were built in the 50s and 60s and before all the new technology we have for um, solar rainfall information and all of the new technology. So we're rewriting the manuals on how to op these lakes, operate these lakes just to store more water and yet maintain the lake's flood control ability. Mm. So Lake Mendocino in California is one of our lakes, Lake Sonoma. Um, the dam in Orange County in Southern California, Prado Dam uh, for Orange for the Los Angeles district, and that's basically by the Orange County Water District. They how do they how do they store more storm water to recharge it? And they've been they've been able to reduce the amount of imported water in Southern California significantly by oh, recharging really? water. Oh, by quite a bit, yeah. Well, like two thirds of Orange County's water supply now is 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 not imported water, local uh, groundwater, and then recycled. Wow, I I would imagine that for for Mowgli who are you know graduating now or 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 are uh, thinking of uh, of their career that uh, hydrology uh, fits in beautifully with. Uh, the whole uh, climate issue. Oh yeah, sure. And it, and I had, uh, I had my love of the outdoors from Mowgli. I was trying to find a career that would let me do be outdoors some. Right. And I worked. My parents lived in Burlington, Vermont, uh, when Rob actually went to University of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And my folks moved to Shelburne, actually. So, and I worked for I worked for a consulting firm. Burlington called Wagner, Heindel, and Noyes. And that was my first. And then I said, wow, this would be a great thing to do. And essentially did that environmental, looking at evaluating water resources, both ground or service water ever since then, whether hmm. it's for lakes or for groundwater. In Hawaii, California, in Los Angeles for several years, about seven years. Um, and now I'm at the Engineer Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And we do projects all over the world. Yeah. Quadulant. And you get to spend... <laughs> You get to spend a good deal of your time in the field. No, not as much as I'd like. Only if because it only a few weeks a year, really. Uh -huh. So, I mean, this year I was three or four weeks in California. No, three or four weeks in Cal so roughly one week every two months. I'm in the field because uh -huh. uh, that's we collect the data and then we analyze it. Right, right. So, so. most of your time is spent analyzing the data but uh, yeah and writing reports and doing meetings and <laughs> <laughs> writing scopes of work and cost estimates and managing the uh, aspects of it because we kind of you know we compress the field work and to make it cost effective yeah so and then for example most of my field work is not i have projects at working on the aquifer storage and recovery in in south florida um, so the field work's done by local folks, either to Jacksonville District. Uh, mm -hmm. For my project, I'm doing a project for, in San Diego uh, what, for, for uh, uh, actually, a, the Corps of Engineers where I work is, manages and builds the um, builds uh, Border Patrol facilities. So we're doing the water, the water supply for a Border Patrol facility. 35 mile east of San Diego. And so I was been working in the field a lot on that, but I'll do the work and then uh, set it up. And then local folks take o it over because it's more cost effective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not expensive for me to go out there. So I go out there, get them started. And then the local folks take it over. Gotcha. 
So, so did you? Where was your degree in hydrology from? No, I didn't get a hydro. I got a geology degree. Oh, well, that's terrific. At, at the University of New Hampshire, yeah. And well, that's that, a great program at UNH. Yeah, actually. they have a really they have a great program. They have I, a great I, program. I studied with this uh, this guy uh, named Paul Mayevsky, who is a glacial geologist uh, and oh yeah, very much. Uh, uh, sort of leading it, ed leading edge stuff on uh, in those days on on climate change. I mean, he was doing um, big coring, you know, projects in the in the Antarctic and the Arctic, and you know, he'd, he'd go off for a month at a time up there, up there, and uh, uh, it was really I I loved glacial geology. I mean, I just that's very interesting, but it yeah. 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 It, but there's not much demand for work wise, right? Consulting yeah. firms aren't doing very much glacial geology. Right. Well, but. I ended I ended up getting a degree, uh, getting a master's degree in in uh, earth and space science so that I could teach. And uh, oh, good. I, then I only taught for a few years for a few years before I ran for office and had to have some other kind of employment. So. uh Anyways, uh, what you're saying, Steve, is that uh, that being a hydrologist isn't exactly as romantic as it sounds. But well, it's still, I would, still a great job. <laughs> it is still a great job, although, yeah, I, and it is a lot of fun. And uh, I mean, I enjoy it. I, I, I'm going to work for at least five more years, I hope. Um, yeah, and I, I just got, I was in a meeting today where, where one of our lakes, uh, Lake Sonoma in Northern California, the U.S. Geological Survey is talking about uh, setting up a instrumentation, stream gauging, so moisture and rainfall uh, gauges, uh, and pay for it. So we're going to get this great data. So oh. I'm super excited. So I've been having a great day. And then reminisce. And of course, I was in New Hampshire last week for 10 days, which I just... You know, I adored love going to New Hampshire. Yeah. I, I try to make a trip up there every year, um, especially in the fall. This so late September, early October is just a beautiful time. Yes, there. it is. Yeah. It's just as pretty in the sun. Summer is just as wonderful, but the fall is also really terrific. Yeah, and there's fewer bugs. Well, though, there was very buggy this year. Oh, was and wetter, and and the streams were flowing way more and way muddier than I ever remember in October. In the last we years. have had a very very wet summer that's what everybody's been saying and the, yeah. you know, the bugs it seemed everybody i talked to said oh you know it was very very wet and there weren't very many bugs and then it got the end of summer and the bugs are there there were lots of bugs in october and usually they're yeah. kind of gone by october right that's right yep but i have noticed that there's that you know when i go out for a walk with my dog i that there's a lot more bugs this fall than there usually are. Because it was such a wet summer and the bugs got delayed, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we, we've talked about the effect of Mowgli on your life, but do you want to like sum that up before I say goodbye? <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I would say, uh, of course, I'm a huge fan of Mowgli for anybody that, that, wants, that wants to send their kids there because it had such a huge effect on me and it really taught me to persevere. And, and you're in a group of other boys, men that also want to persevere. And it sort of, it makes you better because you're surrounded by this, this great group of, of kids that are just focused on trying to, trying to achieve the most you can out of your summer, but yet have a great time doing it. And yeah. I always remember love going to camp. You know, I always remembered really always wanting to go back every year. Yeah. I mean, I remember my first year being a little bit apprehensive, but um, I always remember uh, wanting to go, continue to go. Um, so, yeah, so it's a great experience. I, you know, I think my, I feel it's terrific. So I hope to do more work days and uh, definitely hopefully see as many of my uh, den mates next summer for our 50 year anniversary as possible well steve turnbull thank you very much for taking the time to
to talk with me. I'm going to be at that Mowgli reunion because I want to see all you guys again. <laughs> Maybe we can figure out who that uh, fourth person is in the photograph of you guys on Mount Crawford. That's great. And the other great thing I would say is even if you weren't the the highest achieving kid in your in your class, whatever, because you t you started with your buds in Tumai and then you went Tumai, you know, you go through each yeah, of the dorms. Yeah. And even if you're not the most highest achiever, you still have a great time. You still learn a great deal. Yeah. Um, That's right. And yep. in the end, does it, in the end, everybody has a great time. And most of us can't remember, you know, how many ribbons we got or, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, which ones we got, but we right. all remember a great time getting them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's really true. Yeah. Uh, and I, that says a lot about the experience, I think. I mean, we get, we, we gained confidence from it all but we weren't obsessive about it so that we can remember unless they happen to be on our hat, like Scotty Frank. My hat's around somewhere. I'll have to find in that, you know, but exactly. And I think, you know, you work to one. And so I guess that would be my, my final, you know, my summary is that I, you know, my Mauga experience made me much better person. Absolutely. No, absolutely. No doubt in my mind. So, yeah learned a great deal from all the great it's a great group and it always has been and i i think it always will be yeah yeah i mean i'm extremely pleased you know that they decided instead of private owners in 1963 establish a trust you know put it into a you know into a non-profit organization so that it could thrive right well, and it Steve didn't get didn't end up like tomahawk right a lot of those camps got you know, consumed and made into giant houses for Wall Street, you know, big shots. Right. Tomahawk, you know, a lot of those camps are now luxury houses. Yeah. Yep. So it's wonderful that that it's the legacy continues. You bet. Well, it was great to see you, my friend. And uh, thanks. Well, well hopefully I'll see you next summer, Wayne. You thanks bet. for the time. Appreciate it. Good hunting. Yes, thank you. Good hunting.